So, welcome. And thank you to Lynn Blood and B&H for having me this afternoon and for all of you for coming into this dark room. It's actually really bright right here if you <laughs> need some. <laughs> I can hardly see anything. Um, my name is Susan Soybert, and if you were here yesterday, uh, I gave a presentation in the New Yorker um, ballroom about travel photography. And a big part about travel photography that I've discovered over the 20 some odd years I've been doing it is that food plays a tremendous role. And if you saw Christina Minnemeyer's presentation earlier today, uh, probably a number of other people who talk about travel photography, food is usually part of <clears throat> of any story that you will end up doing or any time you travel. What's one of the most memorable things of any place that you go? Maybe you had a grub in the Amazon or maybe you had a fantastic you know, high-end meal here in New York City. Any place you go, you're likely to have an experience with food. So what I thought I'd talk about today is food photography and how you can use that as an entrance into uh, either a travel story or maybe even into doing a story about a particular culture. So the way that this is uh, sort of laid out is I'm starting at my home in Portland, Oregon, which uh, if any of you know or have, the New York Times seems to do an article about us like once a month about our food scene, which has become um, really, really well known in recent years, um, partially due to the next few chefs I'm going to talk to you about. This is Andy Ricker um, and, no, sorry, Gabe Rucker. I get these two guys confused all the time. He owns a restaurant called The Pigeon, and he is one of the pioneers along with this gentleman, uh, Andy Ricker, who runs Pock Pock. He opened one here in New York. If any of you are New Yorkers, you may have tried his amazing Thai food. He serves authentic. Um, he's been to Thailand a million times. He's got a Thai food cookbook out. Um, but these are all Portland-based chefs that have decided to make Sustainable, sustainability sort of the core of what they do. So a lot of them will uh, use locally produced meats or cheeses or whatever. They make everything in house, everything's homemade. And uh, this next slide, this is of a restaurant called Beast. This is a story actually I shot for National Geographic Traveler. Um, this restaurant is run by the woman uh, here, Naomi Pomeroy. All three of these chefs have been awarded uh, James Beard Awards, or at least nominated. Um, this is, she's a single mom, that's her daughter, August. And they serve these incredible multi-course meals on these long tables. Here we have foie gras bonbons that are topped with a sauterne gelée, which is topped again uh, with salt, and that is served on a charcuterie plate. Um, so if you've had lunch, you're probably going, oh man, I don't want to look at that. But if you haven't, you're like, hmm, probably hungry. So um, this is another pioneer of restaurants that we have in Portland. His name is Jason French. And the restaurant's called Ned Ludd. And what's so interesting uh, about what he has managed to do is that he turned a vacant lot behind the restaurant, which is in this really bizarre industrial building, into a garden. So he, and then he uses that garden in the summer to produce all of his vegetables, which I find really amazing. This is my friend Camus Davis. Camus and I knew each other years and years ago when she was an editor at Sever magazine. How many of you are familiar with Sever? Yes, now it, it, when it first started out, it was a very small publication published here in New York, and then it was purchased by, and the magazine got kind of got bought up and she lost her job and she ended up moving to Portland, why? because Portland's very food centric. She found out quickly that she couldn't work as an editor because there's about two magazines, and I'm really not exaggerating, unfortunately, um, that have a place for food uh, editing, food writing. And so she decided to go to France and learn how to butcher animals. And so she started this um, organization called the Portland Meat Collective. And what it does is it allows people to come in and butcher their own animals. And what that does in turn is it teaches people, it puts you in touch completely with the animal that you're eating. You learn how to use all the parts, so it's no waste, um, which is great. You can go in on a side, in this case we're working with a pig. This class was about charcuterie meats, so it was all making your own salami and some of that, they're not allowed to sell it, but the people that take the class can then consume it. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting, process that she started and this program has grown into something much, much bigger and starting to spread around the United States. Um, of course, you cannot talk about Portland without talking about coffee and 
the requisite tattooed people and dyed hair and all that. I've always loved this picture. This was also shot for a story for National Geographic Traveler. I think, in fact, every single image here was made on assignment for one magazine or another. Um, and of course, you can't talk about coffee without talking about donuts. This is Tress Shannon. I don't know, how many of you have been to Portland? Anybody? We got a few people here, that's great. Did you go to Voodoo Donuts when you were there? Yes? Yes, yay, Voodoo Donuts. So um, the, uh, they're famous for a particular donut that I can't really talk about because it's lewd, but um, th this is their signature donut, which is a voodoo doll. And uh, it's wildly popular. They've trademarked it. I think they're, they're opening overseas or in other cities, and they've become, again, wildly popular. The other th end of the spectrum is the super high-end cuisine. Um, and this is a restaurant called Castagna. Castagna is produced um, a chef that we lost to you guys here in New York. And now Justin Woodward is the chef. And this was my dessert. How many of you see the food? <laughs> Anybody? So what this is, is it's the leaves that you see on this branch are made out of dried apple. So it's this absolute exquisite presentation. And what you'll find with a lot of the food in the Pacific Northwest is that it speaks directly to what you find in the Pacific Northwest, which is a lot of natural beauty. So a lot of the chefs will make these types of creations. But Jeff Wood, uh, Chef Woodward is definitely taking it to the next level. And he is right now up for a James Beard Award. So all of us Portlanders are sort of rooting for him right now, because I, I think his food is, is really magnificent. Um, so as I move away from Portland, I'm heading down to southern Oregon to Folia Farm. And I'm showing this because it's really cute. I'm not going to eat this animal. This animal produces this, which is uh, called Hillis Peak. It's, this is served on, it's a whole wheel of, of goat's milk cheese that's served on what's called a, a girol cheese slicer, which makes these absolutely beautiful lacy pieces of cheese. So my question is, how do you get from that cute little baby lamb to that? Well, Giannaclis Caldwell and her daughter started a 4-H program where they raised Nigerian dwarf goats, just a couple, you know, for a 4-H fair. And then it turned into this entire small industry. And so I was hired by Culture Magazine to go do a story about um, Giannaclis and her family. And it was just so wonderful. They're just such welcoming people. And uh, this, this is sort of a funny story because I, I don't know how many of you attended my talk yesterday, but I talk about how I always carry two cameras, one with a long lens and one with a wide lens. So I was, I was shooting her as she was walking towards me, and then as she got closer and the herd sort of surrounded me, I picked up the camera that had the wide lens on it and started shooting and got this shot. After the, after the shutter released, I heard this crunch. And I thought, that's odd. And then I'm watching the herd going away. And of course, all of these goats are wildly pregnant. So this is the only time they're allowed out. So this is my one opportunity to photograph them. And I'm really bummed because all of a sudden I'm realizing that my camera, something's happened to it. So I take the lens off and I look inside and the mirror has detached from the little thing that holds it in there and it cracks into a million pieces. So I'm sitting there realizing that the goats are going away, looking at this camera in my hand, and all of a sudden, I feel this really warm liquid running down my leg. And I'm thinking, that's weird. And I look down <laughs> over to my left, and there is a female goat looking up, chewing her cud, and she is peeing into my shoe. And I'm thinking, this qualifies as a bad day. <laughs> and I think, what do you do? So I just emptied my shoe out threw the camera away, and I just started shooting with a longer lens. Of course, all of the goats had gone off. The reason why we had um, wanted to make this picture was not only to try to do sort of an interesting picture of Giannaclis, but also what makes Hillis Peak such a wonderfully flavorful cheese is that her goats are allowed to forage in the forest. And that does actually impact the uh, flavor of this cheese, which is, is, was delicious. It, it was an amazing thing. We actually got to take that wheel of cheese home with us. One of the benefits of shooting food is that you are very well fed generally. Um, this is another picture of baby goats because it's really, really cute. I can't help it. 
the editor told me, don't take too many pictures of the baby goats. And I said, of course I won't. So um, of course I did. So when you cover a food story, you work, again, dawn till dusk, particularly uh, when you're working on a farm. Um, these people are hard laborers. Everything is done by hand. And so we got there at dawn and photographed. They keep different goats in different pens. And I thought this was particularly nice light. And then, of course, I had to go photograph the whole process, regardless of how unattractive it was. And I thought this was pretty unattractive. But it shows you that one by one, they are milking the goats for the morning. And Gianna Cleese, of course, is probably not very happy about me being there. And then the next shot, of course, is her taking the milk and putting it into the vat. And then we go through the cheese making process, which I have to say is not terribly attractive. So what I did is I turned off all of the overhead lights and I used available light. So I switched the cheese making table around so that she'd be lit by the window light because I thought, well, it's not very pretty, especially you have to wear hair nets and these gloves and whatnot. Um, but that was one way of sort of helping along the pictures. And the other one was she, when she's done with the molds and they come out of the mold, she covers it in her secret sort of recipe, which has some paprika and whatnot. Um, and then it's put into the refrigerator to age. And like any other story, I cover everything I possibly can. I try to get wide shots, details. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm shooting a city or if I'm shooting a story about cheese. I try to do everything that I want to do, plus whatever the editors have requested. In this case, the major request was not to take too many pictures of the cute little baby goats, which I failed miserably at. Um, and then I had to make some beauty shots of this cheese, because here it is in the refrigerator. It's not, OK, this is what it looks like, but it's not very attractive, and it wasn't completely full. And what can you do with fluorescent light and cheese? And so what I did was I built a set out of an old bookcase that they were trashing. And then I used a gold flex fill on one side. So again, setting up next to a window and using a gold flex fill in order to fill in the, um, the shadow areas of this. And I think it, it turned out quite well. And then I'll leave you with this one last picture of baby goats, because they're so cute. Um, and I'm not kidding. Ha -ha. Nobody laughed. That didn't work. OK, so moving farther away from the mainland of the United States, this is Hawaii. This is a story called um, Undiscovered Maui. And this is the, one of the last villages that remains on the island of Maui. It's on the north it's a west corner of if Maui sort of has like two big nodules and it's way up here in the north. It's very hard to get to. It's in, during pre-European contact days, it was a city of refuge. Um, so then, of course, the Europeans came and they still managed to maintain their village because it's really, really hard to get to. There is a one-lane cliffside road that most rental car companies, when you get to Maui, make you sign a document saying you will not take your car on this road. It's too dangerous. But people do it all the time. You see people that, that have just gotten married about to get divorced on this road because they have to back up because the school bus is coming and the wife's out and the guy's almost driving off the cliff. And it's, it's actually kind of funny. But um, getting back to the village, there's about 100 people who live there. Most of them are direct descendants from the original population. They have lo'i, which are a series of ponds that grow poi, which is one of the staples. And again, I don't know if any of you heard Christina's talk about people who live sustainably. This is a village that definitely lives pretty sustainably. They still fish as part of their main diet. They grow poi as part of their main diet. And then they have all of these stands for the tourists. And so this is how I met the people that live there. I stopped at the smoothie bus. This is where you know you've gotten to Kahakaloa. And this is usually your turnaround point, because this is where the road sort of turns into this narrow, life-threatening situation. Um, and we sat around and chatted with the locals. I mean, you can see, so here are the guys over here on the, oh, that's not, it's not going to work. So the people on the right-hand frame, they're the guys that live here, Chico and his, I think, cousins. Everyone is pretty much related. The population is about 100. I don't know if I mentioned that. It has two churches. And then the smoothie bus, uh, where you can pull up and get a refreshing drink, because it's usually fairly hot this time of day. So these are the guys. We sat around and drank beer with them, chatted with them, and then left. And we said, hey, you know, we're doing this story. We really want to talk to you. Hawaiians are very protective of their culture and their land. 
And the beach that is there is the only beach, I think, on the island of Maui that has no public egress, even though that's illegal, technically. They don't let anybody onto their beach. It's a cobblestone beach, and they use it for fishing. Um, but Chico, the guy on the right, is sort of one of the He's sort of one of the, you know, the glue to the community. He's the person that will talk to just about anybody. He's very friendly. He needs to be that way because he makes his living selling smoothies out of the bus. So we come back the next day, and Chico's there, and he's all like, yeah, come in, throwing me the shaka. And I'm like, great. So, and I start to tell him about what we'd like to do, make his picture. And so he invites me into the bus, and I photograph him, and he's chatting. And then I say, hey, you know, will you make me a smoothie? Again, this is what Dan talked about earlier, if you saw his talk about dancing around the teacup when you're starting to try to really investigate like how am I going to get into this community how am I going to go a little bit deeper and make a little bit better pictures so then I take a picture of you know this is the smoothie a mango smoothie of course and then um, next thing you know he's singing to me because he's about to go into a falsetto competition and we establish this really nice relationship and he says hey well you should go and see my my auntie, but in this case, it's his stepmother, Ululani. She's down in the village, and she has a shave ice cart. And, and so we chat with her for a little while. And part of the problem of this community, like many very small communities, small towns um, that practice traditional methods, is that they're sort of losing, losing their youth. And I, I, I was talking to Ululani, and then this is um, one of her grandchildren who's clearly like could care less that I'm there and only wants to go into town and wants to get out of the island def desperately. So what they're trying to do as a community is really keep their children there, teaching them the traditional methods of how to sustain yourself. And I'll show you some slides of that in a few moments. It turns out Ululani's married to one of um, our greatest living treasures. Uh, this is Richard Ho P.E. And any of you who know anything about uh, ukulele, which I would assume most people don't because I didn't know anything about it. Um, it turns out he's one of the most well-known falsetto singers in our country. He's, he's lived in Kahakaloa his entire life. He um, is tending here to his pigs, which of course he raises for food. And uh, so we sat down and chatted with him for a little while. This is up above back and up above uh, the, um, sorry, Ululani's stand, his wife. And this is Chico's dad. And he talked to us for a long time about sin. He talked to us about Jesus. And I started to ask him, you know, so what do you, you know, who are you? And, what, and then it suddenly started to dawn on me that this guy is probably more to the community than I, I really understood. And he said, I asked him, I said, so there are these churches, these beautiful little churches. And he said, oh, yes, I'm the deacon. And I said, the one, the little cute little green one that you passed by. And he said, yes. And I said, would it be possible for us to make some photographs in there? He said, sure, I'll meet you over there. So he lets us in. And the place is literally falling apart from termites. It's, it's sort of sad because it's, it's definitely a historic uh, piece of architecture and part of the community. But they can't, they use it for certain, certain things. But he proceeded, he said, do you have any audio recording devices? And I said, no. And he proceeded to give us a 30-minute private concert. And it was absolutely outstanding. And um, I actually ran into him at the airport on my flight over here. Um, our flights were all delayed because there was a plane emergency and he was sitting in the waiting area and I heard this falsetto and I thought, oh my gosh, that's Uncle Richard. And sure enough, I went in there and there he was and we chatted for a little bit. So it's nice to be able to go back and recognize people and um, feel like you haven't just abandoned these people and that the, after they've let you into their life. So getting back to the food, the next day they invited me back to photograph fishing. So these are their children who are going to come fishing with us. And they load everything into these little four-wheel drive carts, and they drive around the village. And they, we drove down and had to kind of walk to the beach. But I just love these kids. So we're following the kids th through the little river down to the beach where they are preparing their nets for traditional throw net fishing. Um, which is still practice. You see it throughout the islands. You kind of have to look for it, though. Um, but it's still there, where they, they wrap up the nets in a certain manner so that they don't get tied up. And you'll see them kind of going underneath their thighs and around. It's that way when they see the fish, they'll walk along the shore. And when they see the fish, they'll throw it. So this gentleman, here I'm working with a Hasselblad. 
I was still shooting a lot of film at this point. Um, I really, really like the way the Hasselblad and the Roloflex render an image. I, I have nothing against digital. I love digital, but um, I really do like the way that the Hasselblad works with an f2h, just a normal lens. Nothing, you know. I'm I'm not shooting the whole wide scene in this situation because he's just rolling up his net after he got it out of the ocean. You see, he's bleeding because uh, he had thrown the net in and he brought it back out for me to wrap it up so that he could prepare to throw it again. You can see the weights. That's why when they see a school of fish, they will throw the net, and the net will um, fall into the water. Here is uh, Chico's son. Um, one of his sons, and he's learning how to throw net fish in the little stream that's coming down from the low E, from the taro patches, which I thought was very, very sweet. And I was really glad to see that they're working hard to maintain their lifestyle in the middle of what's basically surrounding them slowly on all sides, which is encroaching development. And then here is the throw net fishing. And you can see his other son has got his snorkel on. He's about to dive in right afterwards and grab the net and the fish and draw it in. It's a really, really sweet situation. So they didn't get any fish. So Chico said, wait a minute. There's another thing that we harvest a lot. And then he said, let me go get some for you. And what it is is he, they collect helmet urchin, which is called, bear with me here, it's kahupal. That can't be right. It must be kahupai, and then limpets, which are opihi, and they eat them raw off the rocks, much like you would eat sushi, sashimi. I was wishing for a little soy sauce, but the rule is you always eat what you are offered. So, as they were gathering up, the son was. The, this is his daughter, is also his daughter. So they're all gathering so enough for all of us to have some and to show me how they open it. There he's Chico's messing around with his son, which I thought was adorable. And this is how they eat it. They just pull it right out, pop it in their mouth. The belief is then they throw the shells back into the ocean to give thanks to the ocean, you know, the gods, and that let it, hopefully that it will replenish itself. The way that you open the helmet urchin, sea urchin are very, very tough. So Chico uses a rock and pounds it open. He opens up and pulls out the row. How many of you have had uni? This is exactly what it tastes like. I mean, it tasted just like uni. I, again, you know, a little soy sauce, maybe a little wasabi. It would have been nice. But I ate it straight out of the shell right along with him. Um, and then he sucks it out with his, his mouth. And it, it was just, it was a wonderful experience. But again, you know, my assignment was to do a story about this village, but to gain access to the beach, to gain access to the people, to understand what, how they wanted to share their culture with me, was through food, which was really amazing to me because it was sort of the last thing I was expecting from Kahakaloa. This turned out to be the opening spread for the story. Another assignment I thought I'd talk about, I'm getting farther away from the United States yet, this is, you can all guess where this is, Sydney. So Sydney, Australia, this was such a killer assignment. These assignments come around every once in a while and um, Again, I don't know how many of you heard Dan talk earlier, but one of the questions that I'm asked frequently is how many, you know, how do you get, how do you get the story? Is it written, blah, blah, blah. In this case, the writer went a couple days ahead of me and he started investigating places. And Dan told me, you can shoot anything that has to do with Sydney and anything that has to do with food, if I'm recalling this correctly, at least that's what I'm remembering. And so it was great. And I called Dan up and I said, hey, you know, it costs a little bit of money, but would it be OK if I rented a water taxi bef you know, before sunrise and went out onto the water to photograph you know, one of the most photographed things on the planet, which is the Sydney Opera House? And he said, yes. So I started shooting before dawn. And you got these wonderful um, viewpoints of the Opera House in complete silhouette with the, the lights were all turned off. And it was really wonderful. So I spent a little bit of time, again, trying to figure out how to get establishing shots. This was one of my favorites. Uh, again, early morning light. This is a different day where I got dropped off by a cab on the other side of the bridge and used as framing mechanisms the bridge and then um, this wonderful wrought iron uh, fence that lines the walkway on that side of the harbor. And then when I, once I started shooting and I walk around, I met these local guys, these fishermen, which were great. I mean, again, 
food. These guys are out here catching fish and then they start talking about like, well, yeah, you know, they don't have them. I can't do a good Australian accent. You know, you're just not, you know, we don't catch fish like we used to. And then I ended up having this whole amazing conversation with these guys who are, you know, long time, you know, local Sydney residents, local population. And, and again, another way to get into a story is talk about food. And then of course these aquarium. This is when we're on the other side of the food chain. I just had to put that in there. <laughs> Underbelly of a shark. And this is something interesting. People talk a lot about stock photography. How do you make money selling your pictures? There's something that you take into consideration now as a photographer. How valuable is the image? How old is the technology in the image? That will date a picture faster than just about anything. So if you look at the cameras, nobody here has an iPhone. So you know that this was taken prior to whatever year the iPhone was released. And this is another time, you know, again, dancing around the teacup, trying to find that opening page spread, trying to find a beautiful picture of the Opera House. The Opera House contains a restaurant that no longer exists, sadly, called Ben Long. Um, and so I was trying to figure out a way to establish like an interior and exterior. And this was one way to shoot at night with long shutter exposures. The water was very smooth. You get the color from the water and then you see little black things in the sky. I don't know if you can make it out under this projection, but those are actually the flying foxes from the botanic garden that have come over to eat the fruit tree that is um, that right behind me where I'm standing in, in this picture. Then there's the ever creepy Luna Park entrance at night, um, which of course, again, is, it's one of these things. Is it a cliche or is it something that you have to photograph in order to have said that you've covered Sydney? Well, I took it as you, I should probably shoot it just because it would be interesting, but I thought I'll go there at sunset and I'll ride the Ferris wheel for a half an hour. And I actually really liked this picture, but it ended up being a little bit too busy for the magazine. This is the interior of Benelong. Benelong is really, really dark. And unfortunately, now, of course, it no longer exists as a restaurant. But what was nice about this was that it showed the opera house. Immediately, you knew because of the ribs. And the light in there is absolutely spectacular in the afternoon. But at night, it is terrible because they don't have very good interior lighting. So I made arrangements to come and photograph during the setup in the afternoon, which it turned out to be a very successful picture. This next restaurant is called Summit, and it's one of two rotating restaurants in Sydney. The other one is called Summit. So I went to the other Summit first, and then I got into a cab and said, can you take me to the other place? Because I'm late for my appointment, and this cab driver decided to take me like 25 blocks out of the way to get back to the other Summit. So I'm so glad for Google Maps now because saves me money on cabs that like to take advantage of people who are lost. So these are but, shot format. Yes, these are all shot with a Hasselblad. One of the things I like about the Hasselblad, again, is the bouquet. What, what convinced me to lose the Hasselblad was one of two things. One, workflow. It's very, very hard now to incorporate film into a digital workflow particularly the one that I use now, when you're processing thousands of images every year. Last year, client deliverables in my Lightroom library were over 18,000. That's client delivered images. That doesn't tell you how many that I actually shot. That's what I processed and sent. So you multiply that times X many years, and suddenly you've got you know, terabytes of information. Um, but I bought a Canon 1.2 lens. You know, the, not the 1.4, but the 1.2. And that, that lens is absolutely astonishingly beautiful. And it's the closest thing that I've seen that mimics what I would get with either a Rolleiflex or my 80 millimeter lens on my Hasselblad. It just really renders the image beautifully in digital. And so I've sort of switched to that now for my workflow. Occasionally, I'll drag out the film um, and take some more film pictures because working with a Rolleiflex has a completely different and a Hasselblad because you're looking down. You don't have this giant thing stuck in front of your face. And sometimes that can be a real asset. It's a Rolleiflex is also extremely quiet because there's no mirror. You have to take into consideration, obviously, if you're close to something, the um, parallax difference. But other than that, it's, a, it's still really beautiful. And I have it, and I keep it in good working order. So, but. Um, Again, when I cover a restaurant, I always try to cover everything, the architecture, 
you know, the food is obviously very important, and the way I like to shoot food is, uh, is, is with a very shallow depth of field, an appropriate wine pairing. If it's, if it's a restaurant like this where you have, um, you know, it's obviously a very high-end place. And the chefs like to insert themselves in as well, of course, because it's their creation. This is, this was the best food I've had in a very long time at a restaurant called Buon Ricardo. And I remember seeing the plate, they said, well, put it on this plate. And I remember reading on the back, not fit for food service. And I thought, oh, well, we're just going to take a picture of it. This is a truffled egg. How many of you have had a truffled egg? Ah, so what they do is they put an egg. This is a practice that's done regularly in Italy. During truffle season, they'll put eggs in rice, and they'll put the truffles in the rice to preserve them. And the truffle will infuse the egg with the truffle flavor because it's a porous you know, medium. When you pull that egg out after a few days and you fry it up, it tastes like truffles. It's absolutely magnificent. So as soon as we were done photographing this, I mean, I inhaled that in about five seconds. It was one of the most delicious things I've ever eaten. <laughs> it was so good. So if you ever get a chance to eat truffle egg pasta, I highly recommend it. Vegetarian, kind of, I guess. This is Peter Bourne. Um, Peter Bourne is, our, is Australia's equivalent to our Robert Parker. This guy is the person that sort of samples all the wines, get, rates the Australian wines. And I, I firmly believe that, that wine, beer, all that, coffee, that's all food to me. It's all something that we sit down. What do you say to your friend when you want to meet? Let's go smoke. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to go have a cup of coffee. Or you're going to have a cocktail. Or you're going to go, let's try this new restaurant. Or let's, there's a place that serves these amazing cookies. Or you know, whatever it is. So much of our lives surrounded by food. But yet, I think that we take a little bit of that for granted. But in my case, I think wine is definitely food. So we were asked to photograph, um, I was asked to photograph him as part of my shot list. Again, I'm sort of following the writer. So he's calling people and doing research and contacting, and then I'm sort of following a couple steps behind him, trying to say like, oh, is there a way we can make an arrangement to see this man? How can we meet him? And then eventually you have all the components for a travel story, but it revolves completely around food. This was ended up being the opener. This is Neil Perry's restaurant called Rock Pool. If you are ever in Sydney, I highly recommend it. Neil Perry's another sort of Australian star chef. This is his bar area. We were not allowed to photograph any of the patrons. That's something that happens very frequently in high-end restaurants. You cannot shoot the customers. Um, so how do I do that? <laughs> well, I cut the customer off on the left-hand side of the frame, and I used the light on the, the woman who was the waitress, and then this bar had this incredible photograph that I just loved of this wonderful seafood. Of course, rock pool, meaning uh, it's, a, it's in this area called the rocks, and it's a tide pool, so hence this beautiful picture that he used to decorate it. And then the chefs not paying attention to me, not having any sense, and a perfect place for the gutter of the magazine. So this ended up turning into a double page spread, which was great. Then, the other thing that's in Sydney, which I didn't realize, is um, I think it's the second largest fish market in the world, um, second only to the one in Tokyo. And it's marvelous. You can walk around to everything. You see all, this, all these things. And the other thing that's there are all these places where you can go shopping and buy fish, but also where you can buy prepared food. So of course I went at dawn, you know, and I went to the auctions, and they weren't very interesting looking. But um, we, as we were sort of leaving and looking at all of the stuff that was being set up for lunch, I thought, oysters, perfect. So I asked the guy to prepare a plate of oysters and then promptly, of course, ate them. The other thing that is really big in Sydney is dim sum. This is a restaurant called Marigold. And I love this picture. I know it's, it's, it's sort of a complicated picture. This falls more into the category of reportage. And I think maybe by now you might be getting the sense that when you shoot magazine stories, you sort of have to be a little bit you have to be able to move with what's going on. You have to say like, all right, well this time reportage is gonna be good, or this time a portrait is gonna be appropriate. Uh, this is a great time to shoot a landscape. So you really have to be malleable in that, in that way. But you also have to be truthful editorially. So I always try to 
set some things up. Obviously, the plated food shots were all set up. But sometimes I just say, hey, you guys, are, are you having fun? And these ladies had just seen each other from college. And they said, yes. And I said, can I take your picture? And they just burst into laughter. So I just started shooting. And this guy's like, I don't know. This doesn't seem very exciting. But I love her reflection in the mirror. You get a sense of the restaurant, which is very busy. You know it's Chinese because it's right there on the menu. And you can see the chicken feet and the dim sum on the table. This was also taken in the same restaurant. I was very taken by these beautiful bamboo um, steamers where the dim sum would come to your table, and I thought that would make a very nice picture. Sometimes I see these things in my brain, and I just have to make the picture, even though they don't get published. I think, I've got to make this picture. I think it would be so cool. So this is an example of that. The other thing that's great, which I love, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more shortly. I'm going to go start have to pick this up a little bit. This is a, the night noodle market, which I just thought was a beautiful place to go take pictures at dusk, where you could incorporate, the again, the visible light with a blue hour. So the light that's coming off of the lanterns, the light that's coming out of the booths. I'm on a tripod, so there's a little bit of movement. You can tell there's a lot going on. But you, you can still see that there's blue in the sky, so it's right at dusk, right after the sun has gone down. This is Cafe de Wheels, a very famous place in Sydney where they serve um, those horrible pies and pasties. I, I, I don't like them. Maybe somebody does. That's great. But for me, they were kind of ugh. But um, I love this couple. I mean, I have no idea what he just said to her, but it had to be dirty. <laughs> so the other place to, again, to establish sense of place, Bondi Beach. What, what else? What's more, you know, Bondi Beach? So I went there at sunset, and yes, this is a perfectly nice picture. But what I was supposed to photograph was the Icebergs Club, the swimming club, and they just did not want to let me in. I kept calling and calling and calling and calling, and I finally got into the restaurant, and they served me this horrible sandwich that was just stupid. And, and I finally got through to the guy that owned the Bondi Iceberg Swim Club. And literally, I packed my bags. I was going to the airport. And I said, I can come right before I catch my flight out of town. And I got this picture, which I love. This is, again, shot with a Hasselblad. And the reason why this picture works so well is part, in part from the lighting. Um, I wanted to get a picture of a swimmer. And I had shot a whole bunch of stuff of people walking up and down. This is one of the saltwater pools. These are the Bondi icebergs. They have on what they call, and I'm not making this up, they're budgie smugglers. That's what they call their swimsuits. It's my favorite word. And then behind me is a giant wall of painted white rock. So I didn't have to have any fill cards, any flash. The balance was absolutely perfect. And it was one of those moments where you go, yes, because there's just one frame. When I got the film back, I knew immediately that this would be a, a killer picture. And this actually won quite a few awards. So we're going to move from Australia to Thailand. This story um, just. Uh, it actually won a NATJA award this uh, year, which I was very proud of. It's for National Geographic Traveler. The story was about called Discovering Old Bangkok. And it really revolved around architecture. And of course, of course, what do you do when you go to Bangkok? You eat Thai food. The first thing I did was go to a beef noodle sh shop across from my um, hotel to get something to eat because there was a long flight and had this amazing beef noodle soup for like a quarter. It was incredible. And this guy was so nice. And I said, can I take your picture? He said, yes. There's just food everywhere, everywhere in Bangkok. And I was limited to Ratakasan Island, which is the old area of Bangkok. So there was just every place you went, people were eating, and it was wonderful. This area is. Um, was one of the areas I was supposed to cover because there's a lot of historic architecture that's sort of falling down. And so I found this nice man, and all of a sudden I smelled something. And I was like, that's got to be Panang Curry. That's like my favorite thing in the world. And there's this couple across the street from that guy, and they have a restaurant. That is their restaurant, that table. And you can see the hours posted above. And the husband and wife said, yes, we'd like to have our picture taken. And I'm like, OK, that is not going to work, but we'll do it anyway. And, um, and then I said, well, what are you? I had the translator with me, and I said, what? What are you making? And she, of course, she said panang curry. And I was like, oh, can I have some, please? <laughs> so she made me panang curry. And it was just absolutely wonderful. But it was so great to walk through these wonderful neighborhoods of, of Thailand, of Bangkok, and see you know, people that are keeping chickens. And well, I mean, these are roosters. But still, it, it was just so great. Part of daily life everywhere was food. This woman was also in the same neighborhood. She's getting ready to go to the night market to sell these um, deep fried crickets. And people don't really eat these. The tourists eat these, I guess. It's not really a staple of Thai diet. 
I've learned. They were like, oh yeah, we sell these to the tourists because they think it's fun. But I found it to be interesting. Ah, thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was what I got from my translator. Was like, this isn't really for. Yeah. Okay, interesting. But for which region? Isan. Isan. Okay. Great. That's good to know. I'm gonna have to write that down. So the other thing I had to photograph, which my translator could not figure out, was a place called Mai Kai Di, and this is Mai Kai Di. It's not a place. It's a woman, and this woman is very, very savvy. She's a very well-known cook and she teaches cooking school but she only teaches vegetarian cooking. She dresses up in traditional Thai clothing, she takes her students to the market to go shopping and then she you know expounds on all the wonderful ingredients. She's always this very animated woman. She was fantastic to work with. So then her students comprised mainly actually of Australians who had come there to take vegetarian cooking school. I have never been so hot as I was in this kitchen. I don't know how they could do it. It was about a million degrees outside and then everybody's cooking over these hot things. I thought I was going to die. So if you don't want to go to cooking school, of course, you can always hit the streets. In, in Bangkok, all throughout the city, there are magnificent places to eat right just on the street. This place had a line of people who were not tourists down the block for these, uh, what I can only take as to be egg rolls or something. At this point, I had lost my translator for a, a couple of hours. So I was wandering around by myself. Again, food everywhere. You have tuk-tuks, you have this incredible major city that's just jam-packed with people and what's everywhere? Food. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to explore a city. The other thing I like to visit, and I think a lot of people like to visit who are photographers who travel, are the markets. Anybody here like to go to markets when they're in different countries? Yeah, it's a great place. It's very rich. And what do they sell at a lot of markets? Food or tchotchke. What's more interesting? food. So this was a, the most colorful stand. I loved it. And people, as I was there sort of towards the end of the day, and as people were coming home from work, they would stop and they would pick up a bag of their favorite curry and just take it home and eat it with rice and be done. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. And the smells. And, and again, you can see details. Again, when you're dancing around the teacup, when you're trying to figure out how do I cover this, you try to do everything, portraits, wide shots, all that sort of thing. This is another market that was mentioned by the writer that was in story. But as I walk through it, this is at dawn. I walk through the market. It was very, it was all fish. And it just smelled bad. And it, it just didn't look very good. And I was like, oh, this is nasty. This is not going to work. But I thought, well, I'll go outside and see what I can do out there. And I thought, this, this actually works. It's a nice picture. But then I realized there was, um, there was a place where the monks would come out. I was told the monks would come out every morning to collect alms. So I sat out here for quite some time until they started one by one coming out of the, um, the Wat and the temple. And all of the people had them lined up. So all the bags on that table are for the monks that are going to be coming out of the temple to collect alms that day. And, and then, of course, deliver prayers in exchange. So speaking of temples, this was my favorite one. And I was amazed to see that people actually brought alms into the temples. This is called Wat Arun, I believe. Yeah, no, Wat Suthat, sorry. Um, and it has this incredible marble floor that's, I mean, it's just so, well, you can see. Very, very beautiful. My husband's, um, one of my husband's friends from art school had died. He had lived in Thailand. And so my husband came with me on this job so that he could help with the burying ceremony. He wanted his ashes spread into the, into the river. So what I didn't know is that his friend's friend was sort of the media liaison for this place. So I got complete access, which was wonderful to be able to hang out all day and photograph the monks without fear of intrusion or being sort of intruder. So I, I finally got my orange monks and saffron robes pictures. But it was just wonderful to to meet these, all of these individuals when I could, or talk to them, or not talk to them, as the case may be. Um, and then here is a monk that, was, that would sit there for certain hours of the day and, again, collect alms, which were all food. This is a different market. It's a, actually a combination of food and flower market. And again, you just 
this is where your reportage kind of kicks in. But then there's all this color and detail, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. The floating market outside of Bangkok is a very, you know, touristed area. But um, one of the things that we talk about sometimes um, about assignment work is, do you pay for pictures? No, absolutely not. I don't pay for pictures. But what I will do is I will buy something. And in this case, I was actually, you know, I, I really wanted to photograph one of the women who was making these coconut balls. They're scallion coconut balls that are made in these sort of um, hot iron dishes. And they were absolutely delicious. So it not only made for a good picture, it gave me a nice lunch, but I also then got to spend some time with um, photographing some of the women who were in the area because all of a sudden it was okay. I was spending money and it was, uh, it was acceptable. So I did not eat this tortoise. You may recognize this tortoise from Ralph's presentations. This is in the Galapagos. And in the Galapagos, um, one of the islands, the island where on Isla Santa Cruz, where the Darwin Center is, is a fish market. And it's where all the locals shop. And I love it. There's this brujo in the lower left-hand corner. He's a sea lion that hangs out there every day. And the nuns, the, everybody that lives there comes down to the fish market, buys their fish for the day, and then heads off. Um, into heads, yeah, heads off into into the rest of their life. So I spent some time at this fish market making some pictures. But it just goes to show you go to the Galapagos. What are you going to photograph? Everyone photographs on the boobies and the tortoises and all that. But there's still a population that lives there that eats and they eat directly from the sea. It's a sustainable lifestyle, and it's one of those things that you don't see very often in pictures from this region. Up in the uh, highlands of that same island are people that make um, moonshine, uh, which wasn't very photogenic, but they roast their own coffee, which was, it smelled so good. It's one of the only things I bought to take home with me. And um, they roast it all by hand. The feather thing there is once you roast it to get the hulls off, you, uh, you, you use the feather to sort of blow them off the dried, the dried coffee beans. And then if you're lucky enough, or if you choose to go on a Lindblad expedition into the Galapagos on one night while you're there, they will make you an Ecuadorian feast. And they made us a roasted suckling pig, which they bought from one of the small farmers on the island. So you ended up being able to, and there's also some papayas and other fruits. So I was very impressed um, on this expedition about to have this wonderful meal, even though we were out in the middle of the, of the ocean. I'm going to leave you in Beckway. Um, my time is up. I always think I love this picture. This was for a story for National Geographic Traveler once more uh, about unique hotels of the C Caribbean. And it was so nice, this moment. And I think this is really what brings us together, moments like this. You sit down on an island somewhere with your buddy. You have a nice cold beer. And you chat about the world. And life is good. So thank you very much for your time. And Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.